Hello, and welcome to the November 2021 ENSO seminar. We will be joined this month by Mark James from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and the, the Embodied Cognitive Science Unit there. And we will be looking forward to Mark's <clears throat> paper on um, laying down a, um, a path to walk in, uh, sort of uh, uh, considerations of inaction design and multi-scale interventions. Um, so we will get started in just a moment. Um, Mark, while you're a, a postdoctoral fellow at the um, ECSU at the, the Okinawa Institute and uh, come out prior from that from um, University College Dublin. Indeed. Yep. Um, and so we will kick things off. We'll kick things off with our, our as we do, um, with our commercial break. Uh, so I have just one a, a quick announcement for the community, as it were, which is just a regarding an upcoming con um, uh, symposium that might be of interest uh, to this community. Um, a little bit of sort of self-promotion here, as it were. It's a, a symposium that uh, I am co-organizing with uh, Uda Bang, Sophia Pedersen, and um, Killian McHugh. The, so it's going to be taking place at the towards the end of April of next year, uh, examining a sort of uh, as we're, we're calling it a convivial discussion, um, a sort of a small, um, gentle symposium exploring the work of the uh, Midwest Psychological Field Station and the behavior setting theory that arose from it. So that's just something we're in the, the planning stages at the moment. We'll be hopefully launching a call for abstracts towards the end of the month. But you can keep, watch these spaces and watch these places. Uh, whether through our Twitter handle or uh, via the website there on the screen. Uh, okay, so shameless self-promotion over. Um, Mark, I invited you just when we, we chatted before to maybe ponder any recent um, or even not so recent publications that you think deserve a bit of a, um, a, a signal boost, something that you've come across recently that you found interesting and will be interesting for the, the ENSO community. Yeah, yeah. So I picked a, a couple that actually I haven't read, but I'm also excited to read. So that'll put us on equal footing. Um, one is a recent paper that was uh, sent my way recently. Um, and that's Rupa Karonen and Eric Wrightfield writing about affordance-based interventions for behavior change um, in, in the context of talking about sustainability. <clears throat> So they've done a lot of work. Um, obviously, Eric has done a lot of work in the past, intersecting design and ecological psychology, but here it seems to be put to a very particular and very needed um, end. The other one, um, the other one I I was I am excited to to read. Uh, I actually just got the audiobook version, so to listen to really. Um, <clears throat> is the late great David Graeber's new text um, published in, in co-authored by David Wengro, and that's The Dawn of Everything. Um, and from what I gather from listening to the podcast, in that text, they kind of challenge some of the, I suppose these, uh, you know, some of the kind of grand history texts that have come out relatively recently that seem to, um, suggests something about the inevitability of particular forms of social order. Uh, so people like Pinker or um, Noah Harari have generally, generally kind of hovered around the, 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 I suppose, the suggestion that we get to something like agriculture, right? And then certain forms are inevitable, certain hierarchical forms are inevitable. And from what I gather from this text, uh, it's a bit of a takedown of that, um, suggesting that uh, it's not that they're inevitable, it's that they're <laughs> brought into being through certain decisions. And uh, that, sounds like, that sounds like something that's going to be quite a refreshing read. Mm -hmm. uh, Excellent. Yes, that, that, that does. I think Graper's work is, um, uh, I've only essentially found him or, or got into his work a little bit <laughs> recently uh, myself over the summer. I was looking at his... Um, his book on debt, which is sort of essentially an embodied theory of money is how it comes out. And it's, uh, 
Mm. Um, it's a good site. It, um, it sounds like a, it'll be interesting to see, as you say, that kind of uh, alternative view or uh, response to the likes of, of Pinker and others about the yeah. inevitability. The, the more inactiveness, really, I guess, the inactiveness of history. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, there was a text came out last year. It was written more for a popular audience, which is no slight in it. It was interesting. Um, Rutger Bergman, I think his name is, um, who's quite an interesting thinker as well. But he, he positioned the history. Uh, what was this? He had some homo... <laughs> homo playfulness or something like that. Uh, so he was basically saying human beings are at, at, at heart or at the most fundamental uh, a playful species. Um, but I, I think the, the line Graeber and Wengro take is that um, it's very difficult to say anything fundamental about human beings, right? It's all sorts of conditions and decisions and so on lead to a certain sort of configuration. So we can kind of tell we can tell a selective story, um, but from listening to them, they seem to have done the work to, to kind of tell something that uh, at least spans the spectrum of possibilities. Excellent. So we will look forward to that, but I guess in the, the more pressing immediate future, <laughs> we will uh, move to the, the seminar um, um, in its, the, the, the sort of the, the seminar portion of this morning. So. Um, Mark, without further ado, I'd invite you to you can share your slides there and we can talk about laying down a path to walk in, in action, design and multi-scale interventions for change. Okay, so is that shared now? It see is, that? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so we've done the introductions, I'll skip over that. Um, <clears throat> What I'm basically going to do is advocate for the intersection between an action and a particular understanding of design. Um, I think this might be understood as an active philosophy of design, you know, applying an active insights to a design understanding. But it's also an active philosophy from design, maybe, where I'm attempting to let an understanding of design shape the inactive stance generally. And in doing that, I'm going to argue that we can we can see design as a spatio-temporally extended form of self-regulation, what, what we talk about in terms of adaptivity, that's operative at multiple scales. <clears throat> so a quick overview. First, we're going to look at some relevant notions from the autonomous and activist position, then some contemporary design theory that understands design from an ontological stance. After that, working some examples, we'll look at how these two positions can be productively brought together. And finally, we can consider some potential implications. So there's a lot to get through here. So I am just going to assume some background um, in this talk, in this audience, with the inactive literature. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the inactive account of self-regulation. This is normally captured using the notion of adaptivity. As De Paolo and Thompson write, adaptivity is the system's capacity to regulate its states and the relations to the environment in ways that result in the avoidance of trajectories that move towards the loss of viability. These regulatory interventions necessarily modulate a dynamical landscape by effectively changing relations to the environment. <clears throat> this doesn't only entail an agent responding to kind of threats to its vi viability on a more moment to moment basis. It also embeds a more comprehensive capacity whereby the agent can anticipate life-threatening circumstances and act in order to avoid them um, and can can do so if necessary by changing its own structure and its dispositions over time. And part of what that means within an active sense is that we regulate an evolving system of habits, habits that undergird the relatively stable relations we have to our environments and to each other. Uh, so within the perspective developed in this text, Sensory Motor Life by De Paolo et al, this set of habits reflects an ecology of nested habitual organizations that function at different scales. 
So we might talk about a simple habit, something like picking up the soap or grasping the soap with your right hand, then a scheme of habits kind of concatenated together, um, something like a routine of hand washing, uh, a micro identity, which is a kind of larger structure within which these smaller structures are nested. So it could be an activity of getting ready for bed. Um, and then you could have something maybe like a personal identity that works across a variety of situations. So something like being hygienic. And the basic idea is that the cognitive ontogenesis of the embodied subject entails the construction, maintenance, and regulation of this ecology. One interesting feature about an inactive account, um, a feature which builds on insights from Diego et al about the autonomy of social interactions is that this type of patterning does not just relate to an individual, but also organizes much of our social life. So this is particularly so in interactions that take on the feature of recurrence, such as in a close personal relationship or shared household or workspace. Through repeated interactions, a whole network of patterns of being together sediments in the relational system. So we might get, again, simple habits like holding hands on a particular side with a romantic partner, maybe with a shared routine of dressing the bed together or the table in a particular way. <clears throat> you might have inter-identities, which is more of a kind of situated mode of being together during a particular activity. Um, and then something like, uh, you know, trans-situational identity again. So it could be something like being a couple, right? You change countries, you're still a couple. There's still something uh, relatively stable there. So such patterns provide a shared background for ongoing interactions, like a kind of like a backing track within which we improvise together. Um, and taken together, this collection of habits that comprise the habitual social life world of a given agent might be understood as its habitus. So the last and active point I want to reflect on is how the dynamics of the habit ecology evolve within an inactive understanding through a process of individuation. The basic account is this, when acting towards a particular end, uh, a body environment system, either individual or collective, will have many component parts, some of which are not yet coordinated, coordinated towards that end. <clears throat> In the language of Gilbert Simondon, these component parts comprise what he calls the pre-individual potentialities. Under such conditions, they manifest a kind of tension within the system between some of these uh, component parts, these potentialities, and the system will kind of seek to negate that working towards a particular end. So if it can maintain its course of action and hold this tension whilst trying out various activities, it will eventually resolve these tensions into some novel form. And what emerges then is the beginning of a new habit that functions more adequately towards that particular end. If the tensions are too great, it's likely that the system will either revert to some prior stability or less frequently it may undergo a more drastic reconfiguration. We'll come back to these ideas again in a bit, but for now let's turn our attention to design. So, when non-designers reflect on design, we might think of celebrated figures from the world of design, maybe a famous fashion designer or an architect, or we might think of a particular designed object or maybe a piece of technology. But as Fry, Tony Fry writes, such associations tell us little about the fundamental character of design. Contemporary design theory, some of it at least, at its, sees design at its most basic as a much more ubiquitous process both in terms of its practice and in terms of its consequences. Regarding its practice, as Fry writes, the ability to prefigure to design is one of the distinguishing characteristics of our being human. Regarding the ubiquity of its consequences, the design anthropologist Arturo Escobar writes, it's literally everywhere from the largest structures to the humblest aspects of everyday life, modern lives are thoroughly designed lives. <clears throat> Indeed, Ezio Manzini, a design theorist at the Politecnico di Milano, has recently written a text entitled Design When Everybody is a Designer. In this text, Manzini defines design as a culture and practice concerning how things ought to be in order to attain desired functions and meanings. So understood in this way, what a capacity for design bequeaths the designer is a form of empowerment. As Fry again writes, at its most basic, design is power. 
to absolutely lack an ability to design, which is the ability to prefigure in some way the world in which one finds oneself, is to be absolutely powerless. <clears throat> In some, design is a mode in which humans acting on the conditions within which they act prefigure them in line with some preferable outcome. For these theorists, then, design is not merely a process of material reconfiguration, rather, it's a, a kind of reconfiguration of our being in the world. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, much informed, uh, I should say, that, that leads these design thinkers to. Um, to adopt what they call an ontological stance to, to design. Uh, so much informed by the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, the framework of ontological design was first introduced in a book many in this audience, I think will be familiar with the 1987 text by Winograd and Flores, Understanding Computers and Cognition. Um, the subtitle there is a new framework for design. Their basic insight, as paraphrased by Escobar, is one already implicit in the above introduction that basically, it basically goes when we design, whether we are designing objects, structures, policies, expert systems, discourses, even narratives, we are creating ways of being. This is what the design theorist Willis refers to as the double movement of ontological designing. We design our worlds and they design us back in an ongoing loop, this notion is captured here, I think, in Escher's famous drawing. Tony Fry cashes out this position by suggesting that what design is in the business of doing is shaping our habitual life worlds. Life worlds. As Fry puts it, the totality of practice strives to regulate, replicate, and modify our domain of habitation, our world. Elsewhere, he speaks about this as a restructuring of habitus by design. So you can almost already see some sort of common language here. For Fry, design functions as a process of redirection. Design, in other words, does not create finished things, but in creating things, it redirects the structuring activity of habitus for better or worse. It is, as Fry writes, a directional practice that brings directional objects into being. So as well as prefiguring the form, the immediate operation, and maybe the symbolic function of the design thing, it also adds it to an ecology of things that remain in process with each other, shaping the ongoing structure of habitus. habitus. Design then is about engaging the ongoing activity of transformation and redirecting it towards preferable outcomes. So let's now bring this back together with the inactive perspective. <clears throat> The basic contention here is that the above insights can be brought together, together to give us a general account of managing change. What I'll suggest is that design interventions entail the modification of available constraints to redirect the individuating tendencies of person world systems at various scales. So central to this is the following claim, which also consolidates, I think, the link between an action and design. And I have to thank my colleague, uh, Laura Mojica, for helping me for, formulate this coherently. Um, <clears throat> Laura is someone who's very interested and you should definitely get on uh, this seminar series at some point. But it goes as follows. Design is a spatio-temporally extended form of adaptivity, whereby an agent regulates their own states in the present but with the intention of supporting the regulation of particular variables at longer timescales. So understood in this way, design is a kind of future resourcing that makes the ongoing regulation of certain variables either possible or easier, either for maintaining some existing trajectory or for, su for supporting a process of change. Um, before looking at some examples, let's just briefly consider some important distinctions. So the examples we're gonna look at follow from these distinctions, um, which suggest that there are different forms of design operative across a number of scales of human living. So I talk about maintenance design, habit design, and identity design. And we'll look at examples from individual cases to added cases and more collective cases. So to begin, I consider the notion of maintenance design which is a general description of how, of how an agent engages the world around them to maintain an existing habit ecology at extended scales. This type of design we can see as operative at multiple scales of human, human living. So at the individual level, 
maintenance design will include things like configuring my desk at the start of the day's work, or maybe buying a new toothbrush when my old one wears. At a dyadic level, such as in a cohabiting relationship, it might include leaving the car keys in a particular place in the house, or maybe scheduling a weekly date night. At a collective scale, such as within an organization, it might include the practices that surround rituals, such as birthdays, uh, retirement parties and so on, or might include more formal activities like review processes. At this, scale, we can, at this scale, we can see how many of our design activities themselves become habituated, right? So the configuring of my desk, the hanging of the keys and so on. It just becomes obvious that design is one means by which the habit ecology regulates itself through the environment at distributed scales. <clears throat> but we don't simply maintain habituated ways of life we also intentionally redirect them for the purposes of change. As it's developed here, such interventions come in a couple of basic forms. So I'm gonna talk about habit design and identity design. Habit design being the more common of the two, which we can consider now. So here the agent regulates its states to maintain them beyond some existing bounds for long enough that some novel stability can emerge. The success of this involves redirecting the individuating tendencies of these systems through reconfigurations of the pre-individual potentialities, the kind of conditions within which one acts uh, in a way that generates the right amount of tension for the right amount of time. So I think as a guiding metaphor for this level of design, we can consider the Vygotskyan notion of the zone of proximal development. So for, for those of you who don't, don't know this, it basically describes a process in which the enculturation of a child advances. A caregiver maintains a kind of tension-filled space by soliciting certain forms of action from the child, maybe holding out a toy or repeating a, wor a word. The child, in acting to reduce those tensions, sediments structures that form the basis for that child's making sense in the world. Crucially, the tensions must be just right, right? If there's too much tension, it breaks down. Uh, if there's too little, nothing interesting is evoked. The child learns nothing. Interestingly, one could say that habit design is a process of designing and maintaining analogous tension-filled spaces for ourselves and each other. Um, so consider an individual example. Your dentist instructs you that you need to take better care of your dental hygiene and that you should start using mouthwash. And so you buy mouthwash and you leave it by the sink in the bathroom. And doing so, you make the regulatory activities that reflect taking care of your dental, dental hygiene on an ongoing basis, you make them more probable and are likely to resolve a set of existing tensions into a new habit. If you left the mouthwash on the roof, for instance, <laughs> tensions would be too great and nothing new would emerge. <clears throat> Here, we, here again, we can see how an extended process of adaptivity is operative. The design is a resourcing of your future self to be able to regulate your action in accordance with the goal of improving your dental hygiene. Elements of it can also serve as a meaningful symbolic reminder of the end to which you're directed and of the variables you are to be sensitive to if you're to be successful. <clears throat> so at the dyadic level, um, an example might be, say, committing to a virtual meeting to start meditating with your friend at a regular time. Here, the success of your efforts will depend upon your ability to co-design this tension-filled space that evokes a set of shared habits that reflect a meditation practice. And I think much like the individual case, the success of our designs at this scale depend on the configuration of socio-material constraints to redirect those individuating tendencies. So this might include everything from articulating the type of practice involved, the length of time you want to do it, how to configure your spaces, um, <clears throat> the places that you decide to sit, uh, calendars, schedules, alarms, designed objects, even ways of languaging and so on. Um, at the social level, the spatial extension of adaptivity is worth reflecting on. There are now two loci of adaptivity that must coordinate towards shared ends. Now the monitoring and regulation of the system is both self and other directed and modifications to constraints within a shared space become the primary means by which regulatory dynamics unfold. At the collective level, the distribution of, activity, of ad adaptivity becomes even more pronounced and all sorts of formal instruments and processes will be devised to support the monitoring and regulation of the system. 
within an organization, for instance, some effort may, may be made to monitor and com communicate performance with respect to key performance indicators, <clears throat> such as the reach, funds raised, impact, rankings, these are the kinds of things we see in academic situations. Um, and regulatory actions that serve to improve the performance of such indicators will be incentivized. So typically such organizations will have many formal design mechanisms. So monetary mechanisms, holiday mechanisms, positional incentives and so on um, that will serve and help the redirection of the habitual dynamics of its members. So one vital insight I think this perspective makes apparent is that social interventions are scaffolded by the design and habits of individuals. At its most, most basic level, the individual who develops the habit of sending the reminders for the meditation practice, for instance, makes the stabilization of the shared practice itself more likely. In this sense, individual design is not only about resourcing the adaptivity of a future self, but also about resourcing social levels of adaptivity. To conclude this level of design, it's worth noting that most design change will be at this level. <clears throat> However, I think more drastic forms of change are obviously also possible. And there may even be occasions in which more drastic interventions need to be designed. So we can look at this level of change intervention as a form of identity design. Um, and this basically just suggests that you have, in a sense, a, a kind of top-down design um, that enforces the reshaping of a, a larger set of habits, either fairly rapidly or over the course of some, some, some period. So uh, just to quickly go through this, and then we'll get on to the implications. The outcome of any design process is unpredictable, but I think this is even more so at this level. The redirecting effects of such designs are either of high enough intensity or long enough duration to displace the stabilities of an existing identity or sediment new ones. And so often such designs will be highly structured and may even be ritualized in some way uh, in the hope of managing their outcomes. So at the individual level, the intensity variety um, might include things like ingestion of psychedelic substances within a ritualized context, of the duration type, it might include embarking on something like an apprenticeship uh, or a PhD or some course of study. Of the hybrid kind, it might include entering a period of rehabilitation, right? We have this kind of intense reconfiguration that's also extended. <clears throat> we can see such forms of design might be more likely to be deployed when their precise target is unclear or a definitive route towards the desired form of transformation is not obvious. <clears throat> this would explain maybe why we're more disposed towards such efforts in the wake of a crisis, for instance, or when we have nowhere else to turn or have hit rock bottom or are looking for a last resort. Um, I think at the dyadic and collective levels, we can also see such forms of design. And normally they have something to do with resolving some conflict or consolidating a relationship. So a couple might participate in uh, some sort of psychedelic assisted couples therapy, for instance. Um, they might get married, they might have children. These are all different, slightly different forms. Likewise, a collective might move toward to a new location. Um, we see this with Tom's group in Boyce, right? People totally reconfigure their lives by uh, switching from Mexico to, to Okinawa, basically overnight. And then we can see other more, say, formal, uh, realizations of this where things like referendum and the writing into, uh, into law of new laws. We can see that regardless of the type of design or scale of intervention, the definition holds. So design is a spatio-temporally extended form of adaptivity whereby an agent regulates their own states in the present with the intention of supporting the regulation of particular variables at longer timescales. I want to just now tease out some implications of this. So the first thing to discuss is what has gone above can serve the development of what Fry terms a design intelligence. Fry writes that the realization of a design intelligence would mean having the ability to read the qualities of the form and content of the design environment in which one exists. 
For Fry, this needs to become a basic life skill like uh, alphanumeric literacy was to the modern world. The perspective outlined here, I think, can contribute to that effort. By practicing through this understanding, we might develop a, a relational sensitivity to the degree to which the conditions of our acting enable certain outcomes. Moreover, it might help expand um, it might, it might expand it by helping to develop a sensitivity to how to resource those conditions to serve the individuating process in a way that is ad adequate to our needs, right? We just get better at this. It's a, it's a kind of skillful designing. And I think such sensitivities can grow at multiple temporal and spatial scales. For instance, the personal scale, the person grows sensitive at shorter time scales to how their immediate environment, including other people, makes certain actions more probable and at longer scales to how those actions themselves provide the conditions for certain more enduring states. But they might also be better able to acknowledge how the conditions of one's immediate environment um, themselves reflect a broader set of enabling conditions, economic, political, ecological, and so on. Um, de developing a design intelligence, in other words, means becoming skillful at stewarding the process of transformation for ourselves, for our relationships, for our collectives, whilst also helping us to see the manner in which these are utterly intertwined. <clears throat> Another thing that this perspective helps us acknowledge is that stewarding change is not about control. One cannot make a new habit emerge in the same way one cannot make oneself go to sleep or make a flower grow. The best we can do is provide the conditions for such things to happen. A design intelligence informed by an understanding of the processes and particularities of individuation and multiscalar adaptivity suggests that skillful interventions for change necessarily entail an ongoing process of listening, of designing with. I think this is getting at what uh, Hannah Diego and others refer to in terms of letting be, a spirit of neither over-determining or under-determining that which has been designed for. As Coopers puts it, Taken uh, talking about this notion in, in the context of design, actually. A design informed by such a spirit would be one that no longer strives for mastering and controlling the world, but follows a responsive and care careful way of an unfolding being and becoming, or of unfolding being and becoming. Dieger talks about developing a sensitivity to, get the, to this capacity for letting be in the context of a loving relationship. I think this is equally possible in the context of the individuation of new habits. It may seem naive to think about such ideas in the context of something so mundane as a mouthwashing habit, but it, is true, it, but it is true our habits that we become all that we come to be. Thus, having a sense for how we can relate to the unfolding of our being and becoming with responsiveness and care, even in the context of looking after one's teeth, can serve as a valuable guide for how we can extend those sensitivities elsewhere. Indeed, one might even say in the context of loving relationship, being present with another in the spirit of letting be is serving their individuating tendencies in a way that is authentic to them. There's an interesting contrast sometimes used within design theory that I think captures some of this spirit. So the contrast is made using the following images. The first image, the image on the left is of a desire path running along some steps. It, in a sense, illustrates um, an overdetermining design not sensitive to the needs of those being designed for. The second image is an aerial view of a university campus in the US. Here, the campus was left partially unpaved until they had enough footfall on it that the desire paths themselves become part of the design process. They were then able to pave over the paths and thus lay pavements in accordance with the designs of the walkers. Now, there's a couple other cool examples. So, um, in Finland, each year after the first snowfall, city officials collect data on the trails left in the, slow, in the snow and allow it to inform their trail planning for the next year. And um, likewise, in many cities, they now use the buildup of snow on the roads after some time of traffic use, what they call snack downs, to inform the, the design, the future design of the road systems. Yeah, so we're coming to a close here. Interestingly, many of these principles can be found in an emerging approach to design theory that, much like the inactive approach to cognition, has its origins in the notion of autopoetic self-production. This perspective of autonomous design is developed by Escobar, who was mentioned previously, Arturo Escobar. I won't go into it here, but 
Um, <clears throat> It basically suggests that uh, the design of any community, um, any community, I should say, needs to practice the design of itself um, at multiple scales, right? So the individual has some autonomy over its design, as does the community and so on. And I see my own account as an effort to kind of flesh out an understanding of the agents of design that is consonant with this uh, eco-political project. So as I understand it, as well as supporting the redesign of design and doing and an active philosophy from design, really the ultimate value of this perspective is offering a vocabulary that might help mediate conversations about intervention on important issues of human living. Firstly, consider that the vocabulary outlined above works just as well in the context of making personal habit changes or changes in the context of a relationship or in an organization. We might even talk about psychotherapeutic interventions using this language. Analogous to how a basic mathematical vocabulary enables the coordination that supports the construction of a building, by supplying stakeholders, stakeholders at various levels with a shared vocabulary, it could, could support the effective coordination of interventions across various scales in the service of a kind of redirection towards sustainability. Additionally, it makes apparent the fact that individual change is resourced by environmental conditions. You just can't escape that fact when you acknowledge all of this. But it also highlights um, that successful change at large scales is resourced by the de designs and habits of smaller groupings and individuals. And this leads me um, to my final point, which is a very speculative, speculative at this point form of praxis. I'm obviously interested to hear what you think about this, that I think emerges from this kind of understanding, um, what for the time being I refer to as habit donation. <clears throat> so the notion of habit donation is intended to capture the understanding in the above account and ask how it might shape something like an eco-political praxis. The basic acknowledgement here is that large scale change needs the redirection of collective action. But as just mentioned, much of the design that supports collective action are themselves scaffolded by the designs and habits of smaller groups and individuals. Habit donation then would be the act of contributing small activities that support the design of collective actions that have high leverage. Ideally, this would be enabled by a kind of decentralized digital network of some sort that allows a community at any scale to clarify a high leverage collective action and distill that into a series of smaller necessary actions that could then be donated as individual habits. Um, <clears throat> this could be mobilized in response to local challenges like a perpetual litter cleanup um, or something like that. But ideally it would be used as a mechanism to put pressure on national and international authorities, you know, by signing petitions, sending emails, organizing and participating in events, but doing it in this way that's consistent. Um, uh, in the hopes, ultimately, uh, obviously, of bringing about ad adequate changes in regulation. And I think this network would be, could be a place where people develop a, this design intelligence that I've been talking about and that others are, are talking about and learn the skills of habit design, put them into practice and observe what comes from large numbers of in individuals aligning their habits to act collectively towards change. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, the wonderful talk and some really, really nice ideas in there. Um, so I will throw open the discussion to those who are live and present. I'll keep an eye on the comments coming in on the YouTube feed as well. So uh, as um, uh, we will start with Mason, you have your hand up there. Um. Thank you very much. This is like really interesting. And I've got like my reading list just expanded tremendously and looking at some of the things you're reading here. Um, I'm kind of curious about the term autonomous design. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm seeing the kind of design you're talking about, I mean, me as an individual or me and my friends as a small community or me and my wife as a dad and so on, often what we're doing in sort of redesigning our environment to support habits, to support growth, change, new identities and things like that is taking advantage of resources that are around in the community. My friends 
innovatively did this weird thing to their house and that looks like a really cool idea. I'm going to adapt and, uh, hey, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that too. Um, so a lot of what I'm doing is not autonomous in the sense of designing myself, but autonomous in the sense of noticing resources that are around in the community, examples of other people doing innovative things that might support new habits for me and incorporating those new practices, new workspace designs, think new apps that might help me organize my life a little better. Um, so when you say autonomous design where a community designs itself, it sounds like you're talking about encapsulated sort of internal to the community as opposed to looking at other communities around adapting by using designs from other places. And so we have this sort of autonomous community and only in the sense of self-directed, not in the sense of encapsulated or anything like isolated. It still would be using, I mean, I look at the city in Finland using the snow and thinking, damn, there's some Canadian cities around that could use that same kind of principle and more people should be taking advantage of the snow left around and designing in those kinds of ways. Um, so, I mean, this is a bugbear of mine for a very long time. What should we mean by autonomous in this sense? Is it a goal or is it a, I mean, it, it almost to me sometimes implies something to be avoided. We think about encapsulated, isolated as opposed to self-directed or internally organized in some way. Is that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this is a kind of ongoing concern, I think, for any an activist um, or anyone familiar with that language and certainly anyone who's trying to extend that language beyond just a kind of a science of cognition. Um, my own bias there, and if we time to get it to it and, you know, <laughs> well, I guess we do now, would be, um, to, to, to venture more in, in the direction of a kind of a, um, a simple thesis, right? So a designing with, but there's still some element of um, an, an acknowledgement that very often people are best suited to find the solutions to their own problems what they need to be, what needs to happen is an enabling of that process rather than an over-determining of that process. Um, <clears throat> so autonomous design is a term developed by Escobar to, if you look at the criteria he has for um, what that should include, it includes everything you've just said. Um, which is, is a trouble you're always going to run into if you're using the word autonomy, right? Because there's a, a received notion of what that means. Um, and within an action, I guess, it's about how does a system regulate to maintain itself um, through change? And, and you can see how, how that actually works from a design perspective. If you're, if you're saying, okay, well, I can draw on all these resources they're not beyond my autonomy in some way, right? It's not emerging from me. It's emerging in this relation, right? The, the, the autonomy is already relational. Um, it's, just, it's just emphasizing, well, for Escobar at least, this idea that, yeah, basically that a community, a person is gonna be best suited to find their, their own solutions to their problems, but that can obviously be assisted. And he has that whole notion of the pluriverse. So he wants to say, yeah, there's one world and we need to be sensitive to that, but there's many worlds, there's many life worlds within that. And as a, as a means to both acknowledge that um, if you start to take this kind of ontological stance on design, you can't get away from that all of a sudden, right? So like, <clears throat> if, you, if you acknowledge that your activity, your experience is, a reflective of, is reflective of those conditions that are evolving you know, in process with design and so on, you can't get away from that pluriversal stance. Um, so his, his notion of autonomy is to try and integrate all that into a political effort. And I think he does it because there are, he's, he's South American, he does it because there are efforts underway in um, South America that have lent on notions of autonomy and so on, but also have historical origins in the work of Maturana and, and people. But uh, yeah, I think that's, but I, I share your, your concern, like one notion I'm thrown around is um, a sim, a sim praxis. So something we do with others, um, <clears throat> we maintain these forms of doing with others. Um, 
but that's a notion I've yet to develop. I was I was messing around with the notion of synonymous. <laughs> I thought that's not going to fly, so I left that one aside. But yeah, I, 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 ultimately I agree with you. Thanks, Mark. And if I just throw out an option for others to come in here. Um, but I guess one of the one of the things that struck me was the, the so I I love the way that you've laid things out, and I think there's a sort of a really rich both vocabulary and set of notions that allow us to think in a, a sort of an interesting way about design and you know, our interaction with our environment. It did at times feel a little bit utopian to me, so <laughs> I the I wondered where the notion of letting be and the, the as you said, it's sort of um, um, the, the, the synonymous view that you're sort of outlining um, runs into two things. One are just um, the real limits of communication in any group above a certain size uh, that you essentially, you hit barriers of cost and time to get mm. messages out and to sort of distribute them. And I know that sort of decentralized digital structures might might facilitate that, but again, they they have their they have their limits. And in particular, one of the things that we've seen is even within these um, ostensibly substantially decentralized and hierarchical digital platforms, you end up with small world type structures which is a small number of immensely powerful influence and, um, influencers and um, people who are genuinely influencers rather than, you know, just use the title and mm. uh, a kind of a larger number of people who are um, perhaps more passive is probably not the right word, but the, so I, I guess I'm wondering about the capacity for us to effectively prov you know, structure constraints um, so that that kind of entrainment of, of small habit can be maintained over the larger scales in any way that is genuinely um, productive and, and, and maintains that capacity for. And I think it's it quite possibly just because of, it's almost like a, a social viscosity. Um, you know, there, the, you might have a large number of people who want to push in one direction, but you're pushing against traditions and habits that are pres present or in and ingrained. Um, mm. And so you might then have a, a sort of a, a shift. You might see a, a social shift, but it's not the one you want. Um, but then that shift has more inertia than any of, again, any of the small contributions as well. And so there's, there's just a challenge about the multi-scalar character of it, which mm. I... I guess I just, I wonder about it and it gives me pause, despite the fact that I'm desperately enthusiastic for everything that you've, as you've outlined it. Um, and that yeah. kind of social viscosity thing. And like, it's not an even, evenly distributed viscosity either, right? It, because of that small world character of, of power structures. Um, but anyway, so I'll, I'll stop talking now and just kind of, I'm curious as to how you've considered it or, or thought about things like influencers within digital communities and so on. Yeah, I, I might answer the question slightly differently, but I, uh, again, I share all these concerns and it is obviously utopic. You know, we get to this grand vision towards the end. And uh, yeah. my, my feeling is that change is happening. Change is resulting from redirection where we introduce stuff into our environments that provide these kind of pre-individual -indi potentialities and stuff gets individuated, right? Habits emerge, habitus emerge. Um, <clears throat> the language here is a, is a kind of attempt to provide something very general that serves as a shared language, such that we can almost, just when we're talking about change, we can have that shared language and point to things, you know? Oh, if, if you introduce that. So for instance, um, <clears throat> In, in a very real fashion, um, like real politic kind of fashion, um, you want to get involved with some form of activism. 
my own experience with that, um, you know, it, it took me a long time to develop anything like a political consciousness that was confident enough to do that in the first place. But my own experience with that has been quite often that very similar to how I might throw myself into something that I thought was really exciting, like learning about a new philosopher or a new uh, instrument. I throw myself into it. Um, I, I'm not sensitive to the individuating processes that are going on there. I get burnt out from it very quickly and I kind of fall off. And then I see myself as not having this uh, political consciousness. <clears throat> if I can start to align myself um, with these collective efforts that are already under, underway, but I can be sensitive to how I can do that in an individual level, that's already an advantage. If we then start to you know, build up that shared lang language at the collective level, whatever the situation is, it's just gonna be beneficial, it seems. Now, it could go wrong. You know, Having a capacity to change, if you are disposed to blindly over-determining um, people on the other side of that change, or you, know, you don't care about the externalities, it's obviously a bad thing to, <laughs> to have a greater capacity to make change. Um, but my feeling, my hope, uh, my experience with this kind of thing myself is that as you kind of sensitize yourself to the, the, the fact that your activity is a manifestation of your conditions, that's a, a broadening circle of care too. You know, I start to care about my conditions. Um, when I see my so-called mental health as a reflection of whether or not my garden is in good order, <laughs> I also have a kind of larger concern for my garden than I would have otherwise. Um, so my feeling has been that there's a kind of a, a, a kind of bulwark against some of the um, potential horrors that could go wrong with becoming really good at changing things. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but you know the, the reality is like like some of the design theorists would say, Tony Fry will say things are changing, we either change them intentionally or not. Design is a very useful kind of means to go about that. And uh, my, only, my only attempt here has been to try and insert uh, the agent into that process as well. And, uh, you know, both to give designers a better sense of what that is. Um, but I also, I also, you know, I'm trying to say that design is this very primordial in a sense, thing this is a kind of adaptive capacity that we should think about more within an inactive framing. You know, like we regular, re regulate our activity locally um, in ways that have these distributed effects. So, you know, as some, something as simple as putting the mouthwash by the, by, the, by the sink, that's a local manifestation of an adaptive activity that actually aims at, you know, regulation down the line somewhere. And certain things come into view when you start to think about that, right? Like how do we form norms? Um, you know, you can even talk about religious political norms. Um, these are kind of forms of regulation that are distributed in some way. And, and I think this kind of language helps you, helps you get a bit of traction on them just to give it a kind of generalized language of, of change and regulation or something at distributed scales. That's excellent. Thanks. Uh, just to, to voice, um, Ezekiel Dipalo has come in with just a brief comment on um, on YouTube, which I think just resonating with what you've said there. Um, so he says, thank you, Mark. Uh, Escobar often uses autonomous design in the sense of designing for autonomy, uh, meaning a rupture with the ideas of design as a service sort of heteronomously given. Um, mm -hmm. So it's precisely a way of critically becoming aware of the circularities between design and habits that you speak of in order to yeah. counteract top-down structures. Um, so it would seem that, that that notion of design as empowerment as, as what you're talking about there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like when you look to the design literature, there's there's been a lot of efforts in this regard. So I do think we have a lot to learn there. And yeah, thanks for that comment, Ezekiel. That's, that's bang on. But it kind of, it does it like part of what you were describing um, at, at, at various stages, particularly when it came around the notion of identity design uh, sort of struck me as almost like there's a, uh, a it was a call for design punk um, of you know let's let's do design that deliberately forces you to pay attention to design 
Um, and but also it, what I thought was interesting was that you didn't address the notion of destructive design. So, and I, again, at the level of identity, you know, revolutionary design, do something specifically not to achieve a particular end, but just to, you know, shake the carpet and, and throw everything up in the air a little bit. And um, yeah. the, there, there is a, whether, you know, essentially the, whether destruction or revolution or, or some version of that is, is the end rather than a, a, a something beyond the rupture being envisioned and worked towards. Um, yeah, yeah. That, you know, in, in order to um, increase the number of, what we need to do here is increase the number of degrees of freedom um, mm. not necessarily get them to go anywhere, but shaking things up literally is is um, is maybe part of the the process. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting example. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we see right with the kind of identity design as I've kind of developed there, this need to impose ritual and very formal structure in the wake of that, you know, so like um, a rehabilitation process or something, uh, or even as, as the example I use, like the, the psychedelic situation where you have, you know, you have this whole um, ceremony and then ritual and then processes of integration that follow on from that and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, to, to consider the, the, I guess, uh, I don't know the right word, but the kind, the kind of design you're, you're, you're getting at, it's, it's definitely one to look at. I think what's, it, what's kind of interesting is, is the fact that it gives us a language to talk about all these different things, right? And kind of go, oh, here's how these things are kind of similar in some way or related in some way. Um, and we can, we can kind of do, a, you know, a polit a, 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 an analysis that keeps the, the subject and, and the, uh, the psychological subject or whatever, or the, I think you know what I'm getting at. Right? The subject is very the agent, as we would typically right, you know, rather yeah. sort of fudgily say. Um, so I'm, I'm going to shut up now. Um, Laura wants to come in, and I think Laura will have to make your comment. The the last question as we're we're uh, running close to time, but please. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mark, for this wonderful talk. It was very nice to finally see all these uh, concepts coming together in such a clear way, and. I wanted to ask you a bit more about the tension that you mentioned at some point of the talk, and then you didn't come back to that. But I was thinking on situations in which you need design that are inherently full of tension. So I'm thinking of the context of Escobar and my own context in countries in which we have a lot of tension, political tension. And you also you want design, design for people to find a way to resolve these questions to resolve these tensions without eliminating the, the tension, you know? So I was thinking whether you could say something about how to incorporate those tensions into design. So I'm thinking more concretely in the extreme left and the extreme right in my country that come and fight. And then the way that they want to design the society is to kill each other. But now we're aiming towards a, some sort of design that allows us to Leave the tension without killing each other, let's say. Yeah, yeah, I guess like, so there's going to be scales of tension too, right? Like uh, even in, in that context, at the individual level, there's going to be tensions within the household organized around these larger tensions. Um, so, you know, some of those tensions are always going to be there and serve this kind of dialectal, dialectic process at a larger scale. Um, <clears throat> but I think, so... Uh, I've, I've, I have come across interesting suggestions before around how to organize politically with, 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 the, with the kind of recognition you're talking about. So some people might suggest that um, there's always gonna be some breadth of political opinion, right? Even if you get a society to so-called perfectly developed, whatever, at right? some sort of utopic end, um, there's still going to be a diversity of, of opinion that needs in some way to be acknowledged and is going to be reflective, reflected in that society. And then I've heard some suggestions that maybe you could include as a, as a kind of new type of political party, a party that serves to mediate the tensions rather than adopting a strong stance. Um, <clears throat> so if you acknowledge that there's always going to be this spectrum 
um, and you realize that, well, it can go really badly if it goes badly and a, ten a particular tension can't be resolved. Maybe you could have some sort of, uh, almost like a radical center that serves, that serves the mediation, serves the conversation um, with some sort of acknowledgement that if, if we do this, things will get somewhat better for, for people um, because as we've done it for a long time, uh, you know, it tends to flip flop in ways that can be really destructive. I don't know if I share that stance, it's probably not my own politics, but as a means of kind of thinking about the kind of thing you're talking about, it might be one way to go. May I say something about it? Yeah. So yeah, actually that's one of the ways that are, are coming up as a solution year after year for 50 years to make this radical center. And it hasn't worked, and now that you were talking, I thought of another conversation we have, and is that in this breadth of people with different political opinions, most of the times the source of tension that becomes violent comes because people don't have the resources to be listened to. So mm -hmm. rather than, I mean, together with this radical center, we need, coming back to Ezekiel's comment, we need a design that gives people the autonomy that they need so they don't have to eliminate the other. That's Absolutely. A way of, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, all of this is framed right by <laughs> an ecological situation that um, is kind of top of the list too, right? And I, and I think people like Fry and Escobar, um, for them, it's 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 the means by which we progress towards what Fry would call the sustainment. You know, we get to a point where we can help people to live sustainably at a longer term, and we do that in a way that's just and equitable. Um, these are all lovely visions. Let's see how they play out. Yeah. Um, well, on that appropriately grand and um, speculative juncture, we might bring this session to a close. So I want to say thank you very much, Mark, for an excellent seminar. Um, appreciate your time. And thank you for everyone who's joined us live here. And we will hopefully see you all again soon for another ENSO seminar. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for listening and engaging. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.